the first half of the semester before our extended spring break. I set us up with plays that psychoanalytic critics, and especially Freud himself, had studied thoroughly, where there was a real agreed upon psychoanalytic set of explanations, and where there was a kind of coherent, cohesive, psychoanalytic version of the story about these works. You, we might not agree with it, we might see holes in it, but they were the, the Freud and his followers and his later uh, disciples kind of stick together on a basic story. And there's an extensive psychoanalytic literature on these. There is not such a psychoana psychoanalytic literature on Titus. They don't ignore it, but they have a harder time with it. For the second half of the class, before we move into you writing your final paper and talking about kind of later, more recent criticism, I want to end with two plays that psychoanalysis has less of a clear narrative about. And there can't be a bigger hole than Titus Andronicus. I might say, putting some of my own theoretical commitments down on the table, that it's really hard when your whole story is about children's aggression against parents to explain Titus Andronicus, which the title character is killing his children. Starts by first scene, kill a son, the second last scene, kill a daughter. Hard to fit that into the whole context of the drive theory and being Oedipal and wanting to get a dad. More interestingly, there are things here that should be of interest to psychoanalysis, but doesn't seem to have been. Um, Sarah has already asked me, where's the psychoanalytic criticism on this because she was looking for some for a paper, and the answer is, it scares. The thing that people log on, uh, that people grab onto early in Freud world, um, starting with Otto Rank, who is the kind of in-house mythologist for the psychoanalytic movement early on, um, Freud's, pardon the phrase, right-hand man, before he gets cut off in such a way. Pardon me, couldn't help it, sorry. Ronk makes an argument that all the mutilation in the play, all the losing hands, all the losing tongues, is in a classic psychoanalytic way, uh, symbolic of castration. And yes, maybe. Um, it's, it's a doubling down on the general idea that all kind of mutilation, blinding, etc., laming, is all kind of symbolic castration. Make of that what you will. Um, beyond that, it's been fairly hard. I went to check myself a, an older reference book, uh, Psychoanalysis and Shakespeare by Norman Holland. This is from the mid 60s. It's a fairly good summation of where the debate was up till the mid 60s. After that, it's harder to track. Um, after that, you couldn't really write a reference book. There's too much of it. You can't really track out all the psychoanalytic literature and put it in one book. But in the mid 60s, you still could. And it's short. Um, we talk about the, 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 um, we talk about the mutilation theme, we, we track it, we talk about some of the kind of mythology that's happening here, and there's a lot of kind of mythic resonance here, and that's true, though it's not really, it's hard for these critics to really tie that directly into Freud's specific teachings. Um, and there's a version of, there's an argument that, that somehow Titus has some kind of repressed incestuous drive for Lavinia. Um, which hardly seems to be necessary with so much else messed up going on in this play. Do we need to import that? Maybe we need to import that because uh, it's all we have in stock. But I think there's a lot going on here that's not this. And let me end this. Um, we may grant that the theme of castration is at least important, meaning here the mutilation theme. But aside from that observation, psychoanalytic writers have not given a cohesive account of the play. That's a psychoanalytic critic talking. But then, perhaps, the less said about Titus Andronicus, the better. Page 277. The less said, the better. That is not helpful to us. In fact, I think there's a lot to be said here. And the fact that there's an aporia that they don't want to explore is, I think, where some of the action is. The less said, the better is where Freud himself on the couch would say, tell me more about that. Let's tease out some of that resistance. 
thank you for your help, such as it is. Professor Holland, let me put you back here on the shelf. Let's see if I can get anything else going on here. I would point out something that psychoanalytic critics might be interested in, but seem not to have been yet, is and yet is Tamara, Queen of the Goths. For once, we have um, we have a mother figure, a, a a woman of an older generation as the love and sex object. We have an intergenerational romance where the woman is a generation older and actually says, I will be a mother to thy youth. This should be so exciting for Freudians, but it hasn't been um, for a few reasons. One is it's figurative and not literal. The Tamara's actual sons are all very sexually interested in someone who's not like her at all. They want the young virginal Lavinia, uh, the new virgin bride Lavinia. Um, who's maybe not a virgin because she's just had her wedding night, just had her wedding night, and then terrible things are done to her. There is um, Saturninus doesn't seem to be of great interest to the psychoanalytic readers, and I think I think there's I also suspect there's a danger here in getting too deep into Titus Andronicus because so much else in the play is so hard to explain in an edible framework. It's also interesting, there are a lot of missing mothers here, as always in Shakespeare, and critics like the feminist uh, Freudian Jan Edelman have talked a lot about mothers in these plays and the absence of mothers and the figure of the mother. Here we have an actual mother who has grown children and is still and gives birth herself over the course of the five acts. We're weirdly not interested in her. Um, so I think uh, I am interested in her, but uh, but the, the literature hasn't been so far. I would point out um, a couple Freudian roots we might take, ways we could tie this to readings of Freud or of later psychoanalytic thinkers. First is civilization and its discontents. This is a late work by Freud, which lays out a basic idea that civilization, society, and he means civilization meaning as opposed to barbarism, um, is what keeps us from, what keeps us clamping down our instincts and our drives. In this model, which will seem like common sense to you, there are basic instinctive biological drives. We all have them. One. Two, in the wild, we would all give them free range. We would just be acting on our primal animal instincts all the damn time. But three, society makes us stop, and particularly he means advanced modern by his standard 20th century sense, forces us to renounce these things to get along. It is society that keeps us from acting on these things. And so there's a constant tension between our kind of libidinal instinctive nature and what society allows. Um, and four, implicitly and explicitly, Freud imagines less civilized people as more instinctual. It's not just civilization versus nature, it's civilization versus barbarism. What's interesting here is that Titus Andronicus is very interested in the Roman versus barbar barbarian distinction. The Goths and Aaron the Moor are classed as the barbarians, the outsiders. The word barbarous comes up a lot, but it's also the case that the Romans are often the barbarous ones, and the Goths will even say so. Who is the civilized and who is the barbarian in Titus Andronicus is a very complicated thing. Um, and some of the things that the Romans do out of the, their civic religion and their civic values seem to be appalling, crazy appalling. I would also bring back our friend, we met him briefly before, René Girard and his masterwork, Violence and the Sacred. In this, from a kind of Freudian anthropological standpoint, Girard argues that sacrifice, including human sacrifice, is a kind of civic tool that prevents civil societies from sinking into violence, that there's a kind of structure 
of sacrifice, of appropriate sacrifice, that in fact it creates social distinctions. These are the people who are supposed to be the sacrificers. These are the sacrifices. That it channels and limits violence and keeps the violence from spreading like a, pardon the expression, an epidemic. Gerard argues that when sacrifice gets out of whack, when it's misaligned and you've killed the wrong person, say you killed your own son on the street, right outside your family tomb, and then you won't bury him. Bad father. Then you have a, then you start to have a kind of general lawlessness, a general escalating violence. And man, this play is about escalating violence like nobody's business. And of course, our, we paired this with an essay about the, the Laius complex, which Devereux calls the, in his groundbreaking essay, still calls it the complementary Oedipus complex. We'll have a video about, at least one video about that essay. Oh goodness, will we? Um, I would point out here in a play full of aggressive fathers where the title character is the most violent father imaginable in lots of ways. And in Shakespeare, he's got a lot of competition. Aaron the Moor is the best father. Aaron the Moor, the most outright villainous character, is the best father. He is deeply in love with his child. He's protective of his child um, to the point where he makes a, you know, Lucius uh, makes Lucius swear, "Don't kill him, right? I'm going to bind you by your superstitious oaths." The bad guy is the good father. The person who is outside society has a paternal instinct that those inside the civilized world have given away. That here, to turn around Shakespeare, uh, pardon me, Freudian slip, they do happen. To turn around Freud's configuration of this of civilization is the thing that takes away your instincts. In Titus, if we make, can make an argument that civilization, Roman civilization has taken away Titus's parental instincts, that there's something his instincts to any instinct to protect and nurture his own children becomes subordinated and subverted by the mores of his culture.